West, there is a conspiracy afoot. It appears that Office 365, OneDrive, looks at user agents to determine performance. This is breaking news on the r slash Linux subreddit, which everyone knows is the bastion. This is CNN Breaking News. CNN level style reporting here, uh, but this is something to consider from Tornator. He says, a few weeks, I've been running Linux Mint 18.1. I got it on my lappy. Uh, I'm still in school. I started a new project. We have a project where we use OneDrive on an Office 365. When he uses Firefox 52 and goes online, he gets it in compatibility mode. Sadly enough, he said, I experienced a lot of performance issues with that. He says, I have a desktop running Windows 10 in the same Firefox 52 web browser. I tried working on the document, and I see no... I see if the problem persists, but it does not. There was no problem. I began thinking about trying a few different things, so he began switching the user agent under his Mint install to make it look like it was running on Windows NT 6.1, 64-bit version of Windows, but still Firefox Gecko. And after changing the user agent, he says the performance problems were resolved. The UI of OneDrive worked flawlessly. The only thing the user, the only thing that was changed was the user agent in the user agent was the OS. He left all the version stuff of Firefox the same. He thought maybe it was a random occurrence, so then he changed it back to the regular agent. Problem comes back. Have we discovered a massive controversy here, Wes? Or do you think it could just be a testing thing? Like, ah, we didn't test that one very well, so we'll put it in compatibility mode. I am inclined to think that you should more often attribute things to bugs rather than malice. Yeah, especially... I would imagine so in this case. Yeah, especially in a case like this where... I wouldn't expect Microsoft to put a ton of resources into researching and yeah. testing the Linux side of things. So they ah, just it should work, but we haven't tested it. So slap compatibility on there. And that call does it seem good. pretty plausible. All Ooh. right, darn it, conspiracy busted right here on the Unplugged program. <laughs> this is Linux Unplugged, episode one hundred and eighty-nine for March twenty-first, two thousand seventeen. Oh, welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's alive and strong. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello, Wes. Hello, sir. You know what, Wes? Today is a great day. We have so many fun topics to cover. Oh, yeah. For, for me personally, there's some great ones in here, too. But I know for some of the other projects the show's just talked about in the past, we got some great updates. And then... And then I am I am really excited. We have a we have a great attendance in the in the virtual lug today. Packed. And I know one of the main topics we're going to get into later in the show. I don't want to say too much cuz I don't want them Shh. to Yeah. Quiet now. I don't want them to to spoil it, but we have we have a really great conversational topic about long-term future desktop like Stuff that's sort of an elephant in the room kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about. We'll also get an update from Ike on uh, what the Solus project is up to. Some new code has been pushed, and I got a few questions, but obviously Obviously, we're going to start with a bunch of updates that are totally, totally rocking. So, Mr. Wes, we've been supplied with. Are these are these a uh, are these an ale technically, or are these considered a cider? Yeah, it's a wheat ale. Oh, it's a wheat ale. Okay, so Wes, to, to help us to help grease the wheels of Linux Unplugged, Wes has supplied us with a passion fruit kicker. Oh yeah, a wheat ale with passion fruit built in. So that is uh, that is that that'll be what we're drinking along here. Here you go. Cheer, here, cheers, Wes. Cheers. Cheers to 189. To Linux. Yeah, and to Linux. And to our mumble room. Oh, speaking of that mumble room, let's bring them in. Time appropriate greetings, virtual lug. Hey, hey. Greetings, progress. Hello. 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 I am very excited. A little bit of uh, late breaking news as we go into the show today. Um, those of us that run Cody are going to be very, very excited by this news. It looks like a proper Netflix plugin could be coming to Kodi soon. What? In fact, if you're on Kodi Android, you can get your hands on it already. So this is um, this is not a sanctioned thing. I'm gonna just get that big big caveat out of the way. But after years and years of user of using different workarounds, there is now sort of this legit Kodi native Netflix plugin add-on being developed. It's uh, it's open source, so that's kind of a big deal right there. Just this plugin itself being open source is nice. Um, because it, not only does it mean maybe we could get off Android uh, coding, but it could also do from architecture. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's interesting because it's it's based on Cody's input stream binary add-on extension, which can serve as an input stream for Cody's video player, which is new since Cody 17, which has been a massive update. The add-on na- enables playback of the DRM protected content without having to break the DRM distribution chain that Netflix uses to encrypt its video stream. 
Now, I think that's important because it means that Netflix might be content pretending like this doesn't exist because you're not you're not doing anything improperly. You're not busting the DRM. Um, it only works with Kodi built for Android, but it should be possible to port it to Linux. Right, like as long as it's not enabling workflows that break your user or agreement it, or make it really easy to make it copy easy to content. pirate. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That, then maybe they will just uh-huh. so the, this slide. It is up on. Uh, it is up on. Uh, <laughs> But this is a messed up post. The Cody 18 isn't. Anyways, it says the prereq pre prereq is Cody 18, but the Pharonix post says the co- prereq is Cody 17. I would guess it's 17 since 18 isn't a downloadable thing <laughs> right now. <laughs> but uh, for me, using the Nvidia Shield Android TV and having Cody on there, and it, I right now I use Cody to also play Plex Media because I, I yes, f- right. I find. Um, I find that every now and then when I back up something, there's like a flaw in the file that I don't catch until I've tried to watch it. And um, the standard Plex player just dies. When oh, I hit a, I hit, it hits a, you know, a couple of drop frames or drop audio package, Crash. it just dies. Cody will just – and then keep going. Nice. Bup, 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 yeah. Go. Right. Um, and it's faster too. And the plus you get all the other benefits of Cody. You don't have to yes. leave Cody. So now I can add one more thing to that. Right, exactly. That, that's where it would change things for me is I could go from – you know, before I have to rely on things like a Chromecast or maybe it's built into a smart TV or I have a third-party device. If it could all just be right in my Kodi appliance, it really would make it more of an appliance to me because I do, I mean, or the people that use it in my life and a lot of us use Netflix. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, otherwise you're always jumping out of Kodi to go watch exactly. Netflix eventually. Now, uh, we have Mr. Colonel Linux joining us this week and he he and I did like this uh, accidental versus like cheap Android TV box versus right. the uh, NVIDIA Shield, which is kind of on the higher end. Uh, I've since bought two more NVIDIA Shields since that review. <laughs> I really like the product, but I wanted to check in with you, Colonel Linux. Are you still using? Uh, are you still using that Android TV you reviewed ages ago, or have you all have you rolled all back to the Western Digital Lives? Nope. I, so I have uh, still in the house. The majority of the um, of the media players are still the Western Digital TV Lives. The box you're talking about is the Matricom, M A T R I C. It's like ninety nine bucks, right? Yeah, I, it's a little cheaper than that, and I have the I have the Q2, which comes with the the built-in IR uh, connector as well as uh, wired Ethernet. Um, and so far, I've had not I have not had any problems. I'm still using that the the Q2 downstairs in my shop, where so basically every day when I'm I'm working on something, I just have it uh, kind of up playing some media, um, and, and I really really like it. They're, they're only I only have two hits. I found once I tried to take it with me to the lake. And the Western Digitals are all 12 volt DC, so you, you know, living in an RV, you can understand why that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And the the Q2 is is five volts, so I have to use a either an AC inverter, I'd have to use like a voltage step down transformer. Um, and then uh, the other thing I don't like about it is there's no there's no the Western Digitals are very square, so they mount very nicely to the wall. And the the G2 is or the Q2 is kind of a I'm surprised uh, how many boxes do space. that. Yeah, that's weird, right? That is uh, that is a thing. Yeah, they do they they do make they make a bracket for uh, oh. the Roku, and I, I was I was planning on using that. But you know, the fact that you have Android means that it works with Netflix, means it works with Kodi, yes. means it, you know, and yeah. and the yeah. ability to to be that flexible is actually worth overcoming some of the other shortcomings. That's how that's that's exactly been my takeaway. Ike, I saw you in there saying. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit of that? I mean, I saw a lot of that. It seemed like you were going, bah, ha, 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 using a player. I just use my web browser like a man. Explain yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, Chrome, I, like I like that YouTube. I do this massive characterization and be like, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I have YouTube and I have Netflix in a browser. I mean, what else do I need? Well, I, think, you I know, don't for, have downloads. I think for I think for me, and I, you know, I think one of the reasons I talk about Cody more is when I when I moved into Lady Jubes, I made this huge shift into consuming a lot of my video content via the television instead of on my, my on desktop. Your, yeah. And it's a totally different experience for me. Like, it, it is a legit way for my, my fiancé and I to sit down. Right, especially when you're sharing it with people. Yeah, and the family, too. Right. Like, it is it has become, like, our primary way of... We don't have television. We barely get any... Re- where I'm at right now, I get decent reception, but uh, usually I don't har- hardly have any reception. Um, so for me, it's... I, I Yeah, obviously, if I'm at my desk, I'm using Chrome. I'm not using Kodi. I'm using Chrome. But if I'm on the if I'm on my TV, I want something that is appliance level reliable and fast. And Kodi's the only one that delivers that. And it has you know like it integrates well if you want to tie in like an IR remote or other things that will be for, feel first class in the TV yeah. ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right now I have it all tied in with the Echo, which oh, is oh right, yeah. There you go. Yeah, something. Don't don't tell Noah. But I just walk in, I tell it to turn on the TV, and it just does all that stuff. Um, all right, well, let's move on because I, I know not everybody cares about Cody. And I, this next one, I just wanted to take a moment. There's 
two pieces of uh, kind of, I don't know if malware is the right term. It's not. Because the first one's ransomware and the other one's an exploit. But I just thought both these stories were interesting, uh, and so I wanted to throw them together really quick. First, I love this. Um, there's new ransomware out written in Python, and it's called Kirk Ransomware. Yeah, it's Kirk Ransomware. Um, and it's the first ransomware, uh. really, that uses the... Are you familiar with this M- Monero, Monero uh, payment? Ser- it's like no, an I'm alternative. Not. It's an alternative to Bitcoin. What kind of big crap? What? Oh, yeah, okay. It's an open source what? cryptocurrency created in April 2014. Yeah, I don't know why I've never oh, heard of no, it. No, I haven't heard of it either. Yeah, but I'm sure... Every, every, you know what? I, oh, I'm going to read on, but I have I have a little bit of bacon about this. I, I kind of I kind of suspect oh, something. You got here. the bacon. Yeah. So it is. Uh, it's written in Python. So it seems like it could probably be moved over to Linux and you know screw up your home directory if uh, you're not careful. Um, but there was one little bit of tidbit that I, I liked about it. It is uh, not known how it's being distributed. So don't worry. This is not like a. This is not something that's like a big deal. I just some of the details are interesting. Um, it masquerades as a network stress testing tool called Low. Orbital Ion Cannon, uh, which yes. we've heard of before. Absolutely. So what happens is people go out and they look for like, I want to do a network stress test, or I want to just be a dick to somebody, and they go <laughs> get low orbital ion cannon, thinking that well, this is the Python script that does it. Turns out, no, actually, it encrypts your home directory. <laughs> um, um, the Kirk ransomware will then generate an AES password that will require the user to put in um, the unlock key to decrypt the files. But this is the best part. This is the best part of all of it. The decryptor tool? Do you have a guess what it's called? It's called Kirk Ransomware. What do you suppose the decryptor tool is called? I'm really hoping for something with Khan or Spock. One of those two. It's Spock. The decryptor is called Spock. Yeah, yeah. You run the Spock decryptor, and uh, they supply that to the victim once the payment's made. Nice. And, you know, I mean, the live long and prosper thing after you yeah, decrypt. You like that's that? nice. That's yeah. nice. They, they got a screenshot of that. I really, some production quality. Like, you know, they wanted the appearance to be nice here as funny. they're it's making meany. you pay them. It's funny. It's It's... It's, I think, a promotion for the cryptocurrency. Yeah. I think somebody created con. this. What? Like, why not con? Like, yeah. Well, I yeah, guess because Spock is saving enemies? the day, right? Because con would be destroying uh, your files and Spock is rescuing Yeah, your so files. if it didn't, if it like fake decrypted and just deleted them, then it would be con. I really feel like this is a promotion for a cryptocurrency. Like, hey, how do we get some uh, movement in the market? You know yeah. what we do? We get people I mean, to have to go it, buy you know? some. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Right. Not only does he get the name out there, but I then I get. about six Moneros. Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. But. I'm mining Moneros right now, dude. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. now, Kirk will ruin your plans, so maybe we should like create a <laughs> fix for this <laughs> yeah. ransomware that will maybe that will be called Con the fix for the man- ransomware. Right, right. I think I think or, I th- or the ransomware should have been called the Wrath of Con. Um, all right, and then just one other thing, just to follow from a story we covered recently that CIA Vault Seven. Well, it turns out now that with some of the I. It's funny because WikiLeaks has been getting a hard time for releasing code that uh, that makes us more vulnerable. But I wish they would have released more code so we could have built better tools to detect where CIA tools are being used. But there have been some people, uh, some antivirus companies, that have taken some of the WikiLeaks releases and generated pattern recognition to detect the tools and stuff like that. So there is some stuff that's coming out. Um, and there's this one. A simple command allows the CIA to commandeer 318 different models of Cisco switches. The bug relies on a Telnet protocol, uh, relies on the Telnet protocol, um, and uh, yeah, over three, 318 switches. All right, what's the command? <laughs> yeah, right? Um, I don't know, because all they say is the bug resides in the Cisco cluster management protocol, which uses the Telnet protocol to deliver signals and commands on the internal network. So I don't, I don't, uh, ours is not really giving you the command here in the, in the article. Uh, I just thought, yeah. I thought we, you, you know, just wanted to follow up on the uh, Vault Seven stuff and also include it maybe with the with the Star Trek malware or I'm sorry ransomware. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, or horrible. Yeah. Both. Both. Now, Will, William, uh, I see you're you're back in the room and your Ooh. your timing couldn't be more perfect because uh, there is one big update on a project that you've gotten me really excited about, and that is Bcash FS. I think a new version has shipped. And lots of stuff's been going on. I think the biggest milestone has been that all of the breaking on disk format changes are landing. Like all that stuff's getting out of the way. That should be over now in theory. But there's also some other big features that have rolled out. Where do you, where should we start when we're talking about the new Bcache? FS. I think the most interesting thing is the on disk encryption stuff that we're doing yeah. now yes. with Bcache FS. That's yeah. great because yeah. you build that right into the file system. And so now you'll have competition in that space. And I think what's even better is that not only do you get encryption, but you also get verification so that someone can't just come along and write bytes to the underlying file system and corrupt your data without you knowing about it. 
Because yeah, with definitely. something like DMCrypt, you just get encryption. It doesn't actually check to see if what you wrote is authentic. Hmm, okay, I hadn't even thought of that. Uh, and then also, uh, can you tell me about the wonders of uh, the new uh, backup superblocks? I mean, that just brings it up into line with what ButterFS and ZFS do, right? So you get a bunch of superblocks distributed across the file system. That way, in case one of them gets right. corrupted, you still have backups okay. to go back to. <laughs> because before, I think on the version that I'm using on my laptop, you just have one super block. So the moment that one thing gets corrupted, you lose everything. So is this uh, is this new in-node format, is this one of the larger sort of practical changes in the new in the new release? It's not necessarily interesting to end users, but it is a little bit more compact, and it does allow him to... Um, add more features to the file system over time. So I think it's actually <laughs> yeah. a good thing. Oh, and also I like this line, being able to fit all of your metadata in RAM. Smiley face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, is, that is very A lot of them nice. are just small underlying changes that make it more performant. User more space FSCK, that seems kind of nice. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah, actually having the FSCK already done before it's even integrated into Linux is probably a huge selling point because neither ZFS or ButterFS had that. How do you feel about the uh, file system migration stuff? So apparently it works flawlessly. I've never tested it. I actually fun to try. am not Maybe using the new version that. yet. Yeah. I'm still on the old disk format. I mean, like somebody wants to bail on ButterFS because it's garbage, or somebody wants to upgrade from Extended 4, or somebody yeah, wants yeah. to purge ZFS from their life. Hey! It's oh! fantastic, because it'll take any file system, it'll build an image, and then you can rewrite that image over once you verify the image is correct. Obviously, this means that you're going to store the data twice. So you have yeah, to be yeah. using less than 50% of your file system currently. Yeah. But it is nice if you have a fairly small amount of data and you want to migrate your root FS over or something. And you could you could also... Oh, yeah, okay. So um, could you could you actually boot from, from a bcachefs file system? Yeah, yeah, I'm booting my laptop. Uh, I'm running the whole thing on Bcache. Oh, I thought that wasn't the a thing. EFI partition. The EFI partition has to be readable yeah, okay. by the EFI. Okay. So it's FAT32. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, it's all Bcache. <laughs> uh, it's built right into the kernel. Unfortunately, that does mean you have to build his Linux tree. Right. Uh, I maintain my own with the most stable patch set. He actually just keeps it at, like, the base 4.9 and just keeps adding patches on top. But I merge in the stable versions every now and then as soon as they come out. So I've just been keeping with that. It's a fairly up-to-date kernel. Like, it's still 4.9. It's not 4.10 or, you know, the RC, but he pushes it forward every now and then. So Kent's assertion here is that uh, RAID 1 and RAID 10 are... RAID 1 and RAID 10 potentially work. It's not very well tested, is my understanding, and I'm not 100% sure the recovery code is even in place. Okay. And then... So it'll distribute the blocks across multiple disks. Uh-huh. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not really sure how well you'd be able to recover your oh, data okay. if stuff went bad. Okay. I know it, it is doing checksumming, so it is aware of disk oh. errors. I'm just not sure what their application code does in the case of seeing an error on one disk if it copies the crunk over from the other disk. Uh, right, yeah. What is the tooling like around the uh, replication support? Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with like ZFS Send, obviously. Is, that, is it in line with Well, that's like, different, right? Okay. And that's sending and receiving uh, file system images, this is, more or less. Or this is different. Streams. Okay, this is different this than is, that? This is the RAID levels. This would be like, you know, running mirrored mode in oh, ZFS oh, or running oh, RAID oh, 1 okay. in ButterFS. Okay, okay, okay. I think eventually he's going to grow send receive support. I just don't think that's a major feature, major milestone on his plate right now. Man, this is sounding like an awesome freaking. This is sounding like my future Linux file system right here. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to watch as it uh, gets closer to being ready to be upstreamed. I think someone said deduplication in the chat room. No, there's no deduplication yet. Hmm. I assume that will also be something that's pretty trivially possible at some point. I think the hardest thing is going to be getting snapshot support. Oh uh, yeah. Why is that? Oh. Uh... Just given the structure of the file system using B trees, it's fairly hard to do snapshots correctly. I think in ButterFS, it's actually fairly complicated logic. I was going because that was going to be that was my next question. Is it yeah. seems like that was something that ButterFS sort of rolled out with? Is is Wait, this, yeah, isn't this they're using a a is this not a copy on, Sorry, is it not a copy on write file system? It is a copy on write file system. Then didn't normally Can well copy the way at the that other point. Two do it is yeah copy you copy it and then just stop. <laughs> sorry, you just stop writing where it was writing and you write somewhere else. Sort of. I know that's a gross oversimplification. It's a gross but... oversimplification, and I don't think those are the underlying issues. Okay. With doing snapshotting well. Hmm. You know what? I I, I would love to know more about that. Maybe uh, we. Yeah. Maybe I, I really more about think it the hardest part. Well, I'm not necessarily very familiar with the topic, but I think the hardest part is actually purging old snapshot data. Oh, interesting. And keeping ref counts correctly and those sorts of things, and then rebalancing the B tree. This is uh, this is this is this is a project we've been watching now for I don't know I mean it feels like it's been it's been a little while now 
Uh, it's been going, yeah. He announced it, I think, in August or June and you've in been, that time frame, somewhere in the summer. You've been, been running it along. for how long? I've been running it since he announced it, basically, on my laptop. <laughs> and I haven't reformatted once. Love it, dude. And I will say, there's probably a bit of corrupted stuff on there. <laughs> we'll just eat a little. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But it seems to be running okay still. I think one of the nicest things is the, tail, the, lo- the long tail latency is fairly low. So all your operations perform incredibly quickly when you're just trying to do small accesses. Oh, man, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, random performance is very good, assuming that the underlying device is also decent. Right, like a modern SSD or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is what you want. Yeah, because the problem with ButterFS, I've noticed, is you get a lot of hangs doing certain operations yeah, every I've now and then. Like, well. it'll just go to sleep for a second and come back. You're like, yeah. Um, yeah. ZFS is better with that. Yeah, Especially under different conditions. There's some conditions where that yeah. seems to be worse, too, with ButterFS. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems... It's not a well-understood thing. Yeah. It's a very complex code base. So, so yeah, maybe there if are I tons grab... of edge cases where you can run into really long tails. And Bcache uh, yeah. does as much as it can to not run into those long tails for I reads see. and writes. I see. So it tries to avoid doing most of the work in the critical path. So if I get this kernel and then... In the synchronous path. Maybe if I compile that uh, WireGuard module too, I can just be the oh, yeah. ultimate That's kernel I'm, hipster. Yeah. So you're just going to switch to Gen 2, dude? Got my WireGuard. Nice. I, Living in, yeah. the, in the future. You I do? Like it. <laughs> it's like William's like, yeah, that's my setup. And what disk are you oh, yeah. using, William? I'm using NixOS. Oh, yeah, that's right. We've that's why that. you're one of my favorites. <laughs> We've talked. We got to do an episode on that. Yes, we do. We can do an episode. I can show you NixOS in production. Awesome. Yeah, write that down. I think... I think I, I think I want to do that. I'd so love to know about it. We'll yeah. figure it out. Okay. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's talk about uh, Solus here in just a moment. But first, first, I would like to say a big thank you to Linux Academy. I I, I am so I am so happy with the growth Linux Academy has seen and, and the pickup they're getting, the partnerships they're establishing now. It's one of those things where if you signed up like uh, a year ago, like every single week, something new and the, just constantly improving, it is so so valuable. Uh, but if you're new to it, I would I would encourage you to get started at linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. You get a seven-day free trial. That is going to get you acquainted with, like, the, the essentials of this platform. It's it's a platform to learn about Linux. It's a platform to advance your career and go into a new field. It's a, it's a platform to double down on the area that you work in. It is so well built because it was designed by Linux enthusiasts, Linux educators, and developers who came together and said, all right, how can we advance Linux? And I had this conversation with their CEO before they were even a sponsor when we just started flirting about <laughs> it's okay, what feeling it out, feeling yeah. it out. Just no, that's 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 uh, that's a whole different hold on, hold that to a different picture. We were we were just kind of talking, just talking at first, and uh, he said, you know, we we watch JB, uh, but I don't understand how you make any money at it. And I said, well, we don't make very much. He's like, yeah, well, we think we might have a way to advocate Linux, make money, and actually improve the workforce in a way that it was like a tool that was never available when you were in the workforce. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, Anthony. Yeah, that'll happen. And you know what? A couple of years later now, it is unbelievable what they've accomplished. Self-paced, in-depth video courses on every Linux, cloud, and DevOps topic, and they're not afraid to branch out into areas that you need. It's very impressive. Hands-on scenario-based labs that give you experience on real servers. Instructor mentoring, that means an actual human being that knows what they're talking about, an instructor that will work with you when you need help. That's, that's phenomenal for the type of courseware they're covering. This is unique to the Linux Academy. They have lab servers that spin up on demand as you need them, a course scheduler for your busy schedule. I would like you to go check them out at linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. That supports the show, and from there you can sign up for a free seven-day trial. Well, the other thing that's nice is even when life gets busy, like say it's the holidays, right, and life is super busy, they have nuggets that can be just a few minutes long where you can just go in and get a little value that week. They have availability planners that can build courseware for your busy schedule. And on top of all of that, you can just log in and just get snapshots of what your progress is at so you can kind of just keep track of how you're doing. You get time estimations for every major topic. You want to learn Python. You want to learn Ruby. You want to learn PHP. It's going to take you six hours, four hours, seven hours. It's like quantifiable. Yep, it's great. Like, you know, I know, I, I don't know how to wrap my head around learning Ruby. I know how to wrap my head around six and you hours. you know how, like, where you have to go find all the documents, then do it. Oh, now, for this sure. This is all just right, right. there. Right. You have an idea of how long and, it's going to take. And for me, taking it down from I'm going to learn this nebulous topic that is is massively broad and there's so many different opinions, taking it from something like that to I'm going to spend six hours and learn a thing is so much more, mo- it's like I have so much more motivation to do that because I, it's a clearly definable object to that same point, you can just browse through, right? You're like, maybe I want to learn Ruby. 
by looking, you can see all the stuff you'll do after going through their resources. You yeah. have an idea like, okay, yes, I'll be able to accomplish my goal after six hours. Absolutely. Linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go there to keep us going. Support the show. Let them know you heard about it here. And then sign up for a free seven-day trial. And by the way, the community rocks because it's stacked full of Jupiter Broadcasting members. They fork like the study cards and stuff so that way they get even better over time. It's nice. And they've got downloadable guides you can take with you and lesson audio, personal notebooks, tools that help you study iOS and Android apps as well. LinuxAcademy.com slash Unplugged. Thanks, Linux Academy, for sponsoring the Unplugged program. So, Mr. Ike joins us again, which is, it's always a, it's always a nice pleasure. A so, treat thanks for me. being here, Ike. I appreciate it, because I know Thank it's not much. like uh, the middle of, it's not like the afternoon over there like it is here, so I always really do appreciate uh, it's it. It's about 9 o'clock, well, 20 to 10 now. I, I, I get, I don't, I'm grokking from what's happened that you probably don't sleep much anyways, yeah, because right. it looks like a lot's been going on with Solus. It got uh, Mate Matei 1.18, uh, got new Linux kernel coming in, got new budget coming in. Tell me what's going on over there. Uh, yeah, basically all that stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and lots of new apps too, or updates. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mate 1.18 went in, I think it was the day after, or maybe even two days after, I'm not even sure now. Uh, we got that into Solus, got that tested very quickly and out to people. No breakages. I was very, very happy with that. Congrats. Uh, we got the lib input support as well, so that's very nice. That's great. Uh, oh, yeah. So man. now people will have less touchpad problems. Really? Yeah, that's yeah. super nice. Yeah, so there's been bugs about that on the tracker, long-standing issues, but upstream solved them, so we have those in. One of our changes from Solus that actually landed for this release cycle was the action I can support within Mate Notification Daemon. Oh, nice. It, it's a trivial little change, but it just allows you to have icons instead of just plain text on there. Yeah. And some applications like Rivenbox express more actions when icons are available. So it's a, it's a more natural use of things like media players. So we was happy to get something in, at least, into that release. Very uh, good. We've got 4.9.16 kernel, I believe we're on now. Uh, we're following the LTS tree for now. Until we got uh, Clear Boot Manager integrated, and then we can have switchable kernels. Ooh. How is that going? That's actually gone really well. So the last bit of stuff that I was doing there was basically implementing proper namespacing on the EFI system partition. Uh. So the decision was made to namespace under the EFI directory. So for Solus, it would be slash EFI slash com dot Solus project. And then all of our files will live in there. And we're going to want to add things like uh, firmware update support in there using the FWUPD project. And I've pretty much finished the Grub2 support for legacy booting. So I need to test that on the laptop. But once that's done, it's pretty much close to a 2.0 and then that will be deployed first as a suicide test in so, Solus. Uh, remind me, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it seems like you're going to be uh, aside from Clear Linux. Won't you be? Won't Won't you be the only other distro that's shipping uh, that as the bootloader? Yeah, well, it's not the bootloader itself. The idea is you oh, okay. explain the it to me because I, I barely understand. So explain it to me. Yeah, so basically, you want to have a safe and bulletproof approach right. to booting and the management of kernels themselves. Right, right. We've, we've broken it down a few tools. weeks ago, and I thought it was actually a pretty brilliant idea. And, uh, it's it's an Intel project, right? Yeah, so basically bootloader tools, you can kind of trust them, not always. Uh, when it comes to things like case sensitivity, it matters to Linux, it doesn't matter to FAT32. So mm. simple things like that. If you was to go and rename some of your directories to some cranky mixed case <laughs> names, and then if you started to use things like uh, Gummy Boot or Boot Control, you're going to run into problems where you can no longer install or update because it's trying to create new named directories that already exist. So it started out at those problems and having having a way of updating to a new kernel and retaining the last kernel without having to have lots of meta packages depending on new versions of those packages to push the updates because you don't want to end up where you've got 47 different kernels on yeah. your system and no way to garbage collect them. So it had to implement a policy whereby it knows if a kernel is booted, which is very simple, that's just a system D job to run the tool, right? It then needs to know what the new default kernel is. It needs to know about different types of kernels and when to kill an old kernel. So basically everything lives in user lib kernel. And once once you call the tool, everything happens in a single atomic, atomic operation. If it can't continue, it's going to bail, and it will try its absolute best 
not to murder your sister. This is really an attempt to get as close as possible to bulletproof kernel updates, right? Yeah, that's the thing. So sometimes, I mean, we've all been there. You've updated the kernel, you boot to the new kernel, ah, crap. You know, it's completely trashed. Now, if you're using Solus or even Arch Linux, you know yourself the way the kernel updates work. Your last kernel is gone. It's just completely gone now. You're on the new kernel. You've had the carpet ripped out from underneath your feet. Mm -hmm. And all your kernel modules are gone. You've got to reboot. So it's all those things. Now, distributions like Ubuntu, they use meta packages to depend on the new package they've put out. Right. But then you still have all those old packages. You still have the complexity of it. You still have poor maintenance of the ESP itself, where you have something like slash VM Linux. How do you dual boot with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it, it's just not really good. I mean, we've dual booted for years with Legacy Boot purely because we all maintain our own separate boot trees. Um, we get away with that, right? When you start having a boot partition, you start to get conflicts. When you've got an ESP, you're almost certainly screwed. So, you know, you need to be able to dual boot. You need to be able to have bulletproof updates and always, always, always do the right thing. So if something does go wrong, you can just boot back to the old kernel. That's going to be a it great It goes a feature. long way to making sure, you know, feeling comfortable with updates, especially yeah. kernel updates. Yeah. I mean, imagine, look at the, just look at the hoops that Mint goes through to avoid kernel updates. Yes. Yeah. I would much rather just know that I can boot right back into my last configuration mm -hmm. if I need to. And mm -hmm. be able to yeah. I mean, that's kind of the main stuff. thing. Now, the problem you have, like, um, if you use system deep boot, you know, it's basically the same as gummy boot, right? Yeah. And Solus, a long time ago, forked gummy boot when we had the whole fiasco of system D oh, really? swallowing. Uh, gummy boot and my reasons there was the whole distro side of it not the actual boot side of it it was things like the case sensitivity because it's actually a case of case ignorance because <laughs> linux cares fat does not care right. but if you try and create two files uppercase and lowercase linux is going to scream but fat again doesn't care mm -hmm. it would just fail to create the file because it already exists linux doesn't know it exists so because of problems like this and um, basically upstream system d didn't care at the time or being able to upgrade from gummy boot 49 i think it was to the first system d boot again they didn't want to implement that logic and i wasn't particularly happy <laughs> so that's why my fork came about but the stuff that went into that 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 approach to the esp and the maintenance of it that's what clear boot manager now does anyway yeah so i can now drop a fork i can adopt system boot, and i can have cbm manage all these things the nicer bits that it does is it automatically generates and maintains the loader entries on the esp so you've probably seen like the loader entries star.conf files that you have what cbm does is it will merge the upstream command line files which is on a per kernel basis so we could have like Linux and Linux LTS. We could have a default command line in those. Yeah. You can have ATC command line files as well, huh. which are then merged into it. It will dynamically find the root partition and put the root equals part into there as well. So you don't oh. have to go looking for block ID oh. stuff anymore. Yes, right? I hate that. You know the pain with that. And one of the nicest things it actually does, um, at the moment it's limited to Draco, but it can actually find out if you're running an encrypted root of S and put in the Lux UUID in there Ooh, for you. Oof, nice. Which I've had problems with that with Grub and if you're manually creating entries with something like System Debo, it's very, very hard to get all those things consistent. Mm. So it yeah. does all of this stuff for you, creates Damn. entries just so you're safe all the time. Papa bless. You see, Kernel Linux, when I say I feel like Solus is a is a different distribution, even if it might be a smaller distribution. I, you know, I think it's something you can't know as a regular end user. Maybe you can tell by certain external properties of a project, but there's no way to really know, unless you listen to these shows, I suppose. Like the heads behind these projects, like Ike, that's you're obviously sol you're solving a problem there with with Clearroot Manager that uh, Red Hat's trying to solve, that Canonical's trying to solve, and. This seems to be a very, very, very obvious way to do it. After you explain yes. it, it's like that makes sense. That's of course that's how we should do it. Like this seems yeah. like, and I really like the the using of of prior art, maybe that isn't well known, but seeing you know seeing that diamond in the rough of like this this is something that everyone can benefit from. That, yeah, that takes a lot. Yeah, of Yeah, I mean a lot of my projects now have been trying to focus on making them distro agnostic. So while Clear Bit Manager obviously started out for Clear Linux to solve a very specific problem. Um, the problem there is we didn't have packages. We have bundles. So you don't have this benefit anymore. 
of you know having these um these meta packages and these new dependencies being introduced you don't have that you have a static file system contents that's atomically written to this this is what you have to work with so the idea was to turn the update mechanism into the delivery mechanism so you'll have like these user lib kernel files that turn up the only thing that really changes there is the sim link so you'd have like default lts or default kvm those point to the newest kernel so there's no there's none of this trying to figure out by the release number or the version which is the newest thing because i did that in the past it doesn't work very well so it looks at the sim link what whatever's the newest one is the default one which should be your basically your head or your tip kernel hmm. and it, it, it took a while to get that right but once it started getting fleshed out it's like this clearly could be used in other places damn so i set about making that agnostic and i've been trying to do that with a lot of my projects yeah you have i agree i you so know I, and i don't, I don't like agree that everybody always takes it up Linux. sometimes yeah. somebody else somebody else just creates the same idea right. and uh, <laughs> but it's a the, start to try yeah. to have less of that now you think arch would actually mm. uh would be uh, would it be open to something like this because I, I mean, yeah. Arch is the perfect candidate. I agree. Really They've is. got a I, very similar process to the way that Solus does it. You know, like you, you have this kernel package and then you have this danger of you're removing a live kernel yep. and live modules from the system. Yeah. And, and that's just incredibly dangerous. And it's got to lead. It's got to be the number module breakage has got to be got to be the number one rolling cause uh, rolling breakage yeah, cause, I mean, right? my it's usb be. no longer works yeah. because these modules have buggered off right <laughs> i can no longer use my speakers or yeah. you have all these problems but yeah something I like this would be very them. easy for them and it's a very fixed scheme so you'd have like a user lib kernel and then you'd have like a kernel dash com dot solace project blah 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 each one has a, a namespace at configure time so you customize it for your distro the the branding stuff that's put into the loader files, that's just taken from the OS release file. So it's all standardized stuff. Uh, one of my rules when I'm creating anything, and you'll see this even in Solus or any other projects I do, not a lot of what I do is original or new. It's just doing something in a sensible way. I'm not necessarily inventing anything new because, again, this is using existing technology. It's just trying to trying to make it sane, basically. Hmm. You know, I feel like. Uh, I, it, well, I guess I, I'll ask you this question: Do you think the uh, success of the Clear Boot Manager might be dependent on the success of Clear Linux? Um, you, do you think it stands on its own? Because to me, it feels like it stands on its own. Well, I mean, it's not one. I mean, I'm not going to talk about the success or whatever of Clear Linux because obviously, I'm not in capacity to do that. Right. right. But Clear Boot Manager itself, while it started out as just a solution for clear Linux, is something that quit very quickly became obvious it had to be agnostic and you know that's something that's maintained in my own namespace up on github quite deliberately and at some stage i probably will change the name as well because hmm. it was at the time it was like okay what's a generic descriptive name all right clear bit manager right yeah <laughs> I, I actually i really that. like it i think it's actually i think it I think it's very good. I, well, so, we're going to get it adopted very, very soon in Solar. So over the next week, I mean, I'm on vacation at the moment, but I'm going to be finishing this up over the next week, <laughs> well, along with the other Solar spits. You know how vacations work. You just go mad at projects. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll get that finished up, tested. Once that's in, we can just throw that straight into Solus. And then immediately everyone is then on. I mean, it's it's been an issue like for over a year in Solus. People like, I, I update and then my Windows entries are gone because what actually happens there is your NTFS and FAT modules have disappeared. And because it's the first time it's trying to load them using OS Prober, it tries to mount the file systems. It can't do them because the modules are gone. So you lose Windows from Grub. And those are the sort of usability problems we've had. Or I've, I've stuck in my headphones, they're no longer working. Yeah, sorry, you're going to have to reboot. You know, the whole thing sounds, it sounds like, it sounds like a really great solution and I can't wait for Solus to ship it because that's, it's an example of something that Solus is willing to do that I just don't think Ubuntu is going to do right now or Fedora is going to do right now. Mm. Um, I, maybe I could tell, but I think once Solus proves it, I think I could see them doing it. But I, I, the reason why I mention that is because it takes me back to the conversation that Noah and I had, um, months ago where he felt like he was kind of writing off Solus because it was some sort of boutique. It was esoteric in a sense. And my, yeah. my point was is it might be slightly boutique at the moment, but it is, it is in that position where it's, it's, you guys are the right size and have the right temperament to, to, to implement sweeping changes like this 
that people that are playing it a little bit safer are not willing to make. And the issue is, if you're always living in the little bit safer zone of Linux, you kind of miss out on some of the best stuff that's being that's, that's happening, and you kind of mm. you kind of miss out on some of the new solutions to solve right. the problems. Like this is gonna this could potentially one day legitimately lead to bulletproof kernel updates on Arch and Solus and other distributions. Like that's a big deal. That's a really mm. big deal. And if you're hanging out on Ubuntu. And it's fine, but you're, you're going to miss it until it until it trickles down years down the road, and that's totally fine and legitimate for a lot of people. But for some of us, you want like, that now. If you're not riding that Solus wave, or you're not on the Arch system, or you're not what do I, insert Distro X, right? Whatever, mm-hmm. you're going to miss it. And I and I think you guys are in a really great position because you've got a good size user base, so it matters. These things matter, and you have to be careful. You have to contemplate very carefully about this. But you're also not at the size where it's so so large that 200 people lose their job if everything falls apart. And so, I mean, that's the thing. We we don't have to play it safe. And one of the things that we have that the other projects don't, and it's it's not me blowing smoke up my own arse here, right? We're one of the very very few independent projects that is not commercial viability is not an aspect in any decision. And that's something that we have that none of the other independent projects have. Because even though they might be independent and they might be, you know, they might be 501c or whatever, they still have interests to consider. Whereas we are fully independent, we can go make changes. And there isn't a board to satisfy, there are no shareholders that are getting frightened by the changes. So we can go in and make the changes that nobody else is willing or able to make. And then, you know... They can say that we've done it. Well, it's all right. And then it might change their thinking as well. And that's one of the things that's, it goes back to, again, like, you know, how do you measure success? If we get people to rethink how they've been doing these things, you know, we're the disruptor at the moment when it comes to Linux. We've chosen desktop Linux and we're going to disrupt and make people reconsider the way things have been going on for the last 10, 20 years, whatever. So if we can only just do that, then we've already succeeded. I like I like that how you phrase that, especially given how much we talk about Fedora as playing kind of a similar role of pushing the edge, but from a very you know Red Hat comes from you know it's a very traditional traditional perspective. enterprise perspective. Uh, so I like that that Solus can come from a very Great different point, place yes. and that's, innovate in, in the same space. That's a super good point. No, were you were you about to jump in there? Yeah, I was just gonna say. So I think I think saying I wrote um, Solus off might be a slight mischaracterization. <laughs> I, I, so I I think I think that. Um, I think that really what I was trying to get at was that it's great to have uh, people that are idealists like Ike. And I, I think it's great to have projects oh, I, that have idealists. I would ideal- have to stop you there because I'm not an idealist. Yeah, I agree. I'm very pragmatic. <laughs> well, if you're, well, it's I, the complete right. opposite. If you're, if you're pragmatic, though, why why exclude Java? Java is you know Java is a very needed thing. And there are Wait, a lot what? of apple- – no, nobody likes Java. I don't like Java. But the reality is I need Java to do half of we the have things Java. I do during the day. Uh, well, the last time that we tried to use it, uh, <laughs> the last time we tried to use Solus, yeah, Java was not working properly, and Simple Help didn't work properly. Oh, Simple Help! Right. I remember. But, that. I mean, the, well, anyway, my, which my, is I an Electron mean, app, isn't it? It's not I, even Java. No, it's not Electron. And here's the thing: we can go on. I mean, there, there, I, I can pick it apart piece by piece, right? We can. Yeah. I could go on and say, uh, there's a, you know, like we could go back to the Minicom thing. I need to be able to use, you know, serial communication. But the, the, my overall mm. point is that you're making, you make decisions with the project that say th- we're not going to do X because I have a belief system of Y, and that's a good thing, and I think you should be commended for it. I don't think, I don't think you can necessarily say that, um, that that we're on the same level playing field as somebody like Ubuntu who says, here are the requirements of XYZ users. Here's what they want to be able to do. Let's accommodate that and make what compromises we need to make to make that distribution useful to those people. Sure, yeah. All right, but what am I doing then if I'm not making compromises for users and addressing real-world needs to look at and reevaluate problems that have existed for a very long time in Linux? And I'm already looking at how other distributions Would are you doing characterize it. I'm saying they're doing it wrong. Yeah. I'm I, saying that they're doing it wrong. How do I, I add software to your distribution without compiling it from source? Install it from the repos. If we don't what have if it's it, not request it. Flatpak will be the future method. Okay, oh. but what if, what, if they're, what if they're okay? Well, if right, what? How do I do it right now? Right, if it's well, not in the repos and I don't want to compile it from source, if I just want to install request the software, it. how do I get it? There? Request it. Okay, we and have a re- bug tracker. And in fact, we redid the requirements after that last. How should we say? Mm. Mild fiasco. <laughs> <laughs> 
we redid the requirements because I basically said the same as everyone else. The requirements were complete bullshit. We know they were bullshit. Right. But, it, but we hadn't the, had a discussion about it until that point. They've been but redone. You still, but you still have a gatekeeper. You still have, ultimately, you still have a person that decides this can be... Right, but that's no different to Debian or yeah. Ubuntu. You still mm, have to request not, a package that's not there. That's not entirely true. I can no, spin yeah, up my own is. PPA. Right, but somebody else has had to package it. How is that different well, from Solus when somebody has to package it? Could I not package it myself on Ubuntu? Yes, but, you, but you're now going around in a circle from what you've just said. You said if it's not on Solus, and it, you know, I, I would then have to package it. That's a bad thing on Solus. But you're then allowed to package it on Ubuntu? What I'm saying, what well, I'm which saying point is, is it? What I'm saying is that as an if I was a software you could make your own you could make your own custom dev package yeah. I could make my own PPA I you could, could just make I, a dev I, file I sure could make it a dev file put it up well, for sure, download look at this you way. Know, like if some... you want PPA support on Solus ask me and I'll set it up I'm not an ogre off in the distance I'm willing to do things <laughs> no, I'm on the mountain, do it. On the if mountain. there is demand for it I will happily do these things there has is to it... be an actual demand but I guess my my, my 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 I guess my overall point is the fact that we're having this discussion now Rather, like you didn't, you didn't see that people would want to add a, a software, and if you didn't have your own method, you wouldn't have included PPA. That that's something that after we've already had the discussion of it being boutique or a not boutique distribution, now we're having the discussion of how we're going to maybe include PPAs. And right. So, so and, if we go back to the so, core problem here is about software availability, right? The thing yeah. is, if you want something like PPAs, you also need people willing to maintain those PPAs. You know, you, you can't just say, Absolutely I'm going to put a PPA system yeah. up because yeah. I'm wasting money. I'm pissing money in the wind if I do that, right? It doesn't help anyone. We've got to a point now where we have people coming through. And I think so far we had something like 15,000 patches with multiple revisions come through to Solus from the community. We're at a point now where our tooling is in place, where we're switching our infrastructure over. There's actually an open bug for this to allow community maintainers for packages within Solus. So that, that in itself isn't really a problem. There has to be people willing to package those things. Our packaging is very, very, very simple. I made our policies very, very simple for those to do that. Now, yes, the software isn't completely there at the moment but then again we're not exactly an old project so there are going to always be things that y you want and aren't there yet if you want them ask us someone's going to put it in it mightn't even be us now because people from the community are doing it it takes time to build things up but it takes even longer to build them up properly and that's mm. what we've been doing so, so would you say that your so would you say your position has changed from the last time we had a conversation where you said that uh, part of your Part of your part of your methodology was to exclude software that you didn't think was appropriate or well maintained. I've been more lax on it, yes, right. Because okay. first of all, we had a policy that's basically come through from the Evolve OS days, and you have certain protective policies in place because at the time you know your capabilities, you know your size, and you know your your technology at the time. Our tooling very much sucked. And we didn't even have Y package or soul build back then. So there are certain things we basically said, absolutely no way in hell are going in because it's going to cause us grief down the road. We've now got to a point where Y package, soul build, all of these tools exist. And it's very, very, very trivial for anyone to just sit there and package something. It's a YAML file. You know, we've got a troop builder. You don't need to install a ton of dependencies on the system. It's very, very easy. So it's allowed me to be more lax on them. Did I take too long in doing the policy? Probably. But the, the conversation wasn't properly had. We saw how it went. Someone went and bitched on Reddit. That's that's not how you do things. You know, people who know me know I'm very upfront. You know, I'll be very blunt about things, but go and whinging behind me back on Reddit, it's not gonna do anyone any favors. You know, raise I, it up with me and we'll fix it. I would respectfully I'd respectfully disagree with the characterization there as well. You know, it's one thing to you know to to me complaining on Reddit is simply going to Reddit before taking any other action and then right, but just I making, hadn't seen it. This is this is the I, point. I if it didn't but, go to me, how was I going to know? Here but so where on the Solus site does it to tell me that I need to Dev direct project.com there's right. a tracker link in the bottom but my point is that he attempted to go through what you know based on based on his based on the time constraints that yeah. he had he went through to try to submit an issue to you guys he yeah. got com formal communication back from the solace project may maybe you had or had not seen it but how is he supposed to know that you know that, uh, what i'm saying is like if i submit something to canonical i don't wait for mark to come back and say uh, you know i'd say did mark personally review this when i submit something to system 76 i don't make sure that well no, Paul, no, 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 no. you're making a very unfair comparison there right 
We are not the size of Canonical. We do not okay, have take it. I, 700 take it. employees. Fine, fine. Compare it to Ultis. Right. I have five, I I have five the employees. the lead developer. I don't personally review every single issue that comes through our company. I delegate out to other people, and I would expect that a customer wouldn't expect me to review every single issue as well. So I think that I think that I think that just because that you didn't personally see it to then and then after he took steps to submit it to you and then was rejected and after that process completed then went on Reddit and said here was my experience I think to characterize that as complaining you know that might be a bit unfair to him right but what I'm saying right long story short is could a complain then say look let's look at the policy nobody then said let's look at the policy and I've said we took too long in fixing the policy, but we did put right. a policy in place. It wasn't the right way to go around it. And that's well, all it comes down to. I, I suppose. And that's a matter of opinion. At the same time, I also don't think it's necessarily appropriate to expect your users to uh, to suggest policy revisions to, to the project because, you know, like to, for, to a large example, as a user, if a software company or software project doesn't meet my needs or isn't willing to work with me, at some point I just say, okay, that's the direction they want to go. I'll go a different direction. That's fine. Hmm. I mean, look, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Right? <laughs> but we are <clears throat> talking about someone who did provide a patch, right? Mm. And that, incur that it does infer not just a user, right? So let's get that bumper out of the way. That is a contributor and a developer. Yes, they had a bad experience, but that was the policy at the time. Yeah. And at the time, the policy said, no, this thing can't go in, right? Well, Which was fair, because at the policy that then said, this thing is basically dead. It's abandoned, right? Then we did revise the policy afterwards. Yes, it wasn't exactly a great experience the way it turned out. And I don't think anyone wanted it to turn out that way. Me and that minor, particular one, guy spoke on Reddit afterwards, and we said, we said yes. it didn't really need to go this way. Right, right? And, and, I, and I followed that conversation. And one minor correction, too. Chat room is reminding me, it wasn't uh, it wasn't simple uh, note that I had problems with. It was simple help, uh, mm. and which, which heavily relies on Java. Just one minor correction. So Yeah, I'm, we've only got open JDK at the moment. I guess, we do like the Oracle JDK, so I just wanna, that might be part of it. I just want to step in here for a second and just say, you know, when I, uh, when I think about this... Uh, I think what I what I what I do take away is uh, almost every time Ike comes on the show, he's evolved in a way that's logical and and understandable on a position uh, like like you know he just sprinkles in you know things like flat pack bombs and things like that in his conversation generally. But that's a huge that is a huge change from where you started originally on this show. And I, as someone who also um, tries to allow myself to change my mind on things and just, you know, get get into something and then decide to change it. Because I feel like if I don't evolve my position, that I'm not taking in new information, I'm not taking in new input, I'm not considering all of my possibilities if I just stay really fast and on, on, on a particular course. So I I guess I, I I look at this and I think, well well, Screw all of this crap. Let's move forward and just get flat packs. Like if this, I'm I'm sick. I am so sick of this conversation. Let's get <laughs> flat packs up in here. And you know what? I'll install the three programs I need that aren't in the repo at this point. Maybe two at this point that aren't in the repo from flat packs. I'm good. I'm good. It, it comes down to a simple thing. It's it's solo started off very 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 tiny. It was basically just me originally making something for myself. It grew. A lot quicker than I expected. You know, it's it's had problems, it's had growing pains, uh, and every so often, you know, we go through this new expansion. Right now, we're right on the edge of one, and you always know when it's coming because mm. you can feel the tension. We have these kind of <laughs> debates as well. You God, know? do I know what they you mean? Do, they do <laughs> happen, right? And at the moment, we're on the verge of expanding again. It's like an exponential growth. We do it every few months, right? And the, the problem we have right now, and it, it's it's basically a meme. Solus has no software, right? And yes, it it's valid. But the thing is, we're willing to look at ourselves and say, right, this thing isn't being done right. We could do it better. So in terms of maintenance load and core software availability, we're basically moving all of our infrastructure into Fabricator, which is the dev.solusproject.com. What that will allow us to do is allow people within the community to own a Git repo within Solus, which corresponds directly to a package. They'll be able to publish it directly to the unstable repo. Obviously, we'll have checks and stuff. Don't worry about that. But for the core repo, we're going to go from just a few gatekeepers. And that kind of is the problem here, isn't it? It's gatekeepers, which is what Noah said, right? We'll go from just having a few, select few, to a basically this tick list of what is okay to go in. And we've even got a two-distro rule. If it's in two mainstream distros, you know, it goes in. 
Well, oh, nice. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. interesting for yeah. sure. Because yeah. it was it was com- it was so anal, but it ah. protected us during growth. So then we'll have this checklist. It's there's a few things that it basically says, you know, like if it's introducing huge stack complexity. Whoever said getting there is half gonna... the fun, never Whoa! Oh. Whoa, Kyra. <laughs> Sorry, I <laughs> over eager. <laughs> Kyra was very excited about you. Huge stack. That was really scary. <laughs> that, was, that was one of the scariest things ever happened on this show, actually. <laughs> yeah, if it introduces like really large complexity, um, like something like plasma, then someone would have to maintain it because yeah. okay. we can't do it ourselves. That's very logical. That Outside of the core applications, we're we're going to back Flatpak. We're going to help get them hosted. You know, like, and we've done the the GL validation for the the OpenGL driver support, Nvidia, and stuff. So there will be choice. It's not all completely there now. But if you look at it, the the last year or so, we've been building that engine, that core part of Solus, and defining what Solus actually is, right? Now it's the time when we say, let's flesh it out. Let's legitimize ourselves as a distro. And that's where we're at now. So we've been a project. We've focused on the OS aspect for, for a very long time. And now it's about legitimizing ourselves as a distro, as a larger player within the scene. And yeah, we're going to want the community to help us do that. You know, it's like Kyra says, getting there is half the fun, and we're exactly. watching it's about, half the fun. <laughs> just like people are watching Last go through a, a, a transition. Uh, you know, we watch Solus in some sense go through a transition, and uh, I, I don't know. I so I find that all to be. I find I find everything from from flat packs to clear boot manager to the latest Mate all to be extremely interesting mm. developments. So thank you for coming on. And, and sharing right. I would say one last thing yeah. before I go now. A lot of things I say, or a lot of things I say about Solus, I am not saying it in a blanket statement way. Solus is for some people, it's not for everyone. It's the same as for a budgie. It's for some people, it's not for everyone. When I've complained about things like Vala before, it's it's good for certain jobs, it's not good for everything, right? Use the right tool for the job. We need to stop being so religious and trying to blanket apply these things to every given situation. Solus is not trying to dominate every market. It is trying to go for the home and give users a good experience. Like that does not mean we're going on satellites and we're going on servers <laughs> or Raspberry Pis. We have a given focus. If it doesn't work for you, that's great. We work on projects that go on over distributions too. Work with us on those things. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Boy, that's a great philosophy. I got one question for you. Uh, Bungie 11, when am I getting it? Bungie, Bungie 11, 11, when's it shipping? When's Bungie? I know Bungie. When's we Bungie? Need it. Right. When is so it shipping, right? right? Yeah, we're doing 10.3 first because we have some issues with Bumpkiss. known 3.2. Bumpkiss, that's old stuff. I don't want it. No, yeah, kidding. it's old. It's crusty. It's, <laughs> and it's, blah, 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 blah. it's It's well refined. It works good. It's stable. <laughs> well, apart from alt tap. Who wants those? Though? Don't even get me started <laughs> on the alt. Okay, okay. So Budgie 11, we're looking to have that basically in next quarter. And we're we're right on the edge of going into next quarter now. And we will be one in testing on that. And I'm going to I'm gonna try and see if we can do some kind of unstable testing images. So you can just download them and give them a go. Cool. I don't know how that's going to be working yet. But, yeah, I mean, that'd be kind of cool if you can just get, like, unstable builds of Budgie and just yeah. try it out. Yeah, I think that'd be, and maybe submit a few so, yeah, then It's going to be a few months yet. Very good. Uh, very good. Yeah. All right. Kind of stay tuned. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for taking the time. And like Kyra says, getting there is half the journey and half the fun. I know that. I'm coming. I'm going to go to Texas. You're about to find out. You know what? Dylan, my son, that my day. my drive down to Texas lands right on a spring break. No. So Whoa. he's going he's gonna to go with us. He'll be there the whole trip. That's it's awesome. going to be a ton of fun. Uh, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use my Ting MiFi. I'll have a CDMA and GSM MiFi. Go to linux.ting.com to sign up. You get a $25 discount if you sign up. Or if you're bringing a device, they give you $25 in service credit. Now, your average Ting bill, $23. <laughs> Can you believe that? I heard an ad for a network the other day. It was just 23 or no, actually, it was 22 It was just $22. For the entire line. That's before your usage. That's before $22 just to add an, a line. A line. $22. Ting is $6. GSM and CDMA, $6. $22 just for the line. So no, it's $6 and you pay for what you use. Minutes, messages, megabytes. You add them up. Whatever you use, that's what you pay. It's really easy to keep track of it too because they got apps for your mobile device and they have a totally killer website. They also have really good customer service if you need to talk to a human being and get some actual support from a geek. 
Ting's, Ting's got that. They have CDMA and GSM, so you can either bring a device or pick whatever works best for you. I'm mentioning that because that's huge for me right now. Because most of my trip, I'll be on GSM, but there will definitely, absolutely, without question, be times where I need a CDMA network. And that's what's so great about Ting. I got the tools to keep control. I can turn them off when I'm done. That's something else I think that is maybe overlooked because there's no contract. There's no early termination fee. You can turn a line on for two months and then turn it off. I got this little tracker that I was, I've been thinking about putting in the rig again so people can track the trip. Well, I, I'm like, I use that once a year. Am I seriously going to go get a contract or I'm sorry, it's not a, an agreement. Am I going to, for, for, for something I use once a year? No, that's ridiculous. I'll put it on the CDMA network. I'll pay it for uh, one month and then I'm done. I can use these devices like the tools they are. Linux.ting.com. Go there, check them out. And you know what? Since we had a little random Kyra, let's go get an app pick from Kyra. Because otherwise, that's just like we got hanging Kyras. So we got to get this in here. Whoever said getting there is half the fun never flew economy. Oh! I'm Kyra and this is the Ting app of the week. Take the RV, Kyra! Tripcase. Tripcase aims to take the trouble out of travel. If they don't already have a slogan, they're welcome to use that one. The first time you try Tripcase, it might blow your mind. What, what? When you get a travel email confirmation, just forward it to what? trips at tripcase.com. That's it. All the relevant details of your trip are now on your phone. If there's a change in your itinerary, if your flight is delayed or the gate changes, you'll be among the first to know. Tripcase can send you a push notification of changes if you give it the okay. It's about more than air travel though. Tripcase can help you plan your trip on the ground too. See details on your hotel check-in and out as part of your itinerary. See what the weather's like at your destination with oh, a 10-day man. forecast. Is that perfect or what? Tripcase has detailed maps of many airports, which is super handy, especially if you have time to kill before you fly out. All right. Decide what you want to do while you're visiting by pinning attractions, appointments, and stuff you want to see on a map. You can even get driving directions or book a ride with Uber with a couple of taps. Damn, dude. Tripcase Solid is free one. in the Apple App Store and in the Google Play Store. All right. Links are directly below. Thanks, Kyra. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Ting on YouTube and get the latest App of the Week episodes, quick unboxings, reviews, and much more. Ow! Until next time. Linux.ting.com. It's mobile that makes sense. Thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Unplugged program. Now let's roll into a few more updates just really quick. First one I like a lot here. This is a big one for the beard. Serious Sam Fusion 2017 is rolling into public beta. He says this is a great game. You ever played any uh, Serious Sam? Oh yeah. I have not. Oh, actually, that's not true. I've played one. I've played one of the Serious Sams. Also, there's going to be VR support. And the other thing that's really big is Vulcan support. In fact, Core Team is bringing Vulcan to their Linux ports. This is another big publisher that's going to be using Those Vulcan. Those are awesome. Yeah, man. This is this is a huge deal, actually. Uh, so it's in beta right now, 64-bit, Vulkan, multi-threaded rendering, totally new save system, Those all of that. buzzwords, man. All the buzzwords. Buzzwords I love. Also, while we're in the sort of uh, media consumption category, uh, this is no longer a uh, Valve update, but so we'll close the Valve section. Goodbye. But um, Mozilla has proposed Obsidian. Do you know what Obsidian is? I don't. Uh, well, besides being obviously what, what, it was, what the original user. Hold on, hold on a second. Here, come on, come on. Hold on, Wes. I got. You I, got this. We can't. Gotta get out of the. Gotta get these out of my pajamas. But I feel like we can't go any further. I feel like I would be negligent. Yes, you would. Uh, you in would. my duties as a host of the show, define obsidian. Obsidian, a hard, dark, glass-like volcanic rock formed by the rapid solidification of lava without crystallization. Obviously, right? I think the IRC is right, though. We can't forget about the Obsidian Order. Uh, you know, yes, right, right. The, I, uh, the Obsidian do? Order is uh, one of my favorite uh, groups of uh, spies that are directly modeled after our own CIA, which is pretty frightening. So Obsidian has been published as a possible pro proposal from Mozilla as the next WebGL technology. Yeah, as a, as something, you know, you, pr you, you probably stay hip to this, but the Kronos Group has been uh, getting ready for WebGL next and uh, they've been looking for for uh, new proposals on the on the next version of WebGL. And guess who one of the first to submit a proposal was Mozilla Foundation. Uh, they say this is a, a draft proposal for the new GPU API for the web called Obsidian. It's a low level API that provides maximum feature set for the GPU to web applications. The API is designed for web assembly, modern GPUs, and multi-threaded environments. 
Now, WebAssembly just recently shipped in Firefox as a default feature. It's kind of a big deal. Also shipping in Chrome's latest, I think, version I 53. So. And it's in WebKit's development builds, but not in any, uh, like, Safari or anything. Uh, now, Mozilla already has a prototype that's been built into Servo, which provides a metal-like API in WebIDL for JavaScript backed by Vulkan. Ooh. Yeah. So this this is this this is a big deal. This Obsidian thing could work out to it's provide. One of the reasons I'm glad Mozilla is still around. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise, who knows who would be pushing this agenda? Yeah, exactly. Now I also wonder why we're in the media section, I'm, and uh, I know we have uh, we have we have a big conversation still to get into, but I wanted to talk about this really quick because I think this is going to be one of those things that silently passes in the yeah. night, but has long term ramifications. Uh, at midnight on March twentieth, two thousand seventeen. Dolby's last relevant patent on Dolby Digital expired. So we're talking AC3 here. So if you have AC3 audio in any television show you've ever captured, any television show or movie you've ever downloaded, um, in fact, some cameras record in AC3 audio, all digital television is AC, it's mandatory, actually, for digital television. Yeah. Uh, a lot of internet streams actually come in AC3 that are high fidelity. Netflix can use AC3 to give you a, like a surround sound. Surround. Yeah. Uh, And if you take out all references to Dolby and uh, any Dolby properties, you can now ship AC3 technically. This is this is huge. It's out of patent now. Yeah. And uh, you can find out more at AC3, the number three freedomday.org. And uh, if you first of all, if you've ever played for the Fluendo Media Pack, like I have a couple of times, you were paying for AC3. That's going to go away now. That's just you can just just be included in the in the distro now, I would assume. Um and uh, it also means that most live TV content can now be legally decoded. Most recorded TV content from like a PVR, legally decoded. Videos from DVD or Blu-ray, le- the audio can yeah. be legally decoded now. Um, some camcorders and uh, uh, mostly Netflix and maybe Hulu that uses AC3 in their streams. I'm not sure. Uh, and maybe Amazon. Anybody that offers but you surround see sound. it a lot in establishment. Oh yeah, things. man. Yeah, it's all over the place. So it's pretty great. much all of the videos I play back on my media box probably yeah. have AC3 audio. Almost all of them. So that's a big deal. And again, you can uh, you can find a link in the show notes if if you want to check it out. I, I it's funny because it's one of those things where one day di- you don't even notice it, right? It's just eventually distros will start. Well, it's been a, it's been six months. I haven't sued anybody. Like, yeah, let's, let's, just let's just include it, and then it just all of a sudden you're just legally playing files. You didn't even realize. Yeah, right? It's like it used to. It used to be back <clears throat> back in my day. We we couldn't even play MP3 files or MP4 files. You couldn't even play an H264 yeah, file, right? And 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 now the kids today, they're just. They're just randomly playing MP3 files. They're randomly playing H.264 files, and now their AC3 like audio nothing. is just going to work like nothing. They didn't. They didn't have to buy a codec pack. Nope. They didn't have to extract it and put it into a dot folder. Kids today. Yeah, there was no you know sketchy ooh uh, G streamer bad ugly ah right G- yes oh my god oh oh man all right so there's a topic that I've been wanting to discuss and I'm really glad that Noah's here because I think he's going to be. Uh, somebody that's g- gonna chime in on this. Uh, but before we go, I got I got to thank. Yeah. I got to do this because I, I even just recently, just recently, spun up a digital ocean droplet, tried out an open source project, did a little hmm and ha, and and then just destroyed the droplet. And probably in two hours, I was done. A digitalocean.com. Go there and use our promo code do unplug to support the show. This is a great way to get a Linux rig with a crazy great 40 gigabit E connection, all SSD storage, KVM for the virtualizer, with data centers in New York, San Fran, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Toronto, Germany, and Dimension B. They got them everywhere. You have a great control panel that's really easy to use, super intuitive. If you're a total noob that does barely kind of understands what a server is, maybe you've never even heard the team the term uh, VPS before or a droplet. You're going to be able to use this. If you've been setting up virtual servers for a decade, you're going to be able to use this. And best it, this is like, do you use the API? Because I'm, do, oh, you, yeah. do you? Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, man. I. That's me throwing a piece of paper around because I'm so excited about the API. For me, I use it every single day, multiple times a day. What kind of things do you use it for? Well, I, what my favorite part about it, one, you can just use it like, I mean, I've used it in my own scripts, but because it's so easy, a ton of community stuff like Vagrant, yes, right? Dude. Vagrant has a have yep. a writer. 
basically any scripting component, they probably have a like drop in digital ocean. Just you spin up a droplet, you run your code there, done. A couple of open source projects I've checked out have a button on their website that uses the API and you click the button and then it, it, it just connects to your account and spins up a droplet with the whole stack. Ubuntu LTS, Docker, a container with, the, I mean, it's just like one button and you have the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> and it I feel like TO like is up dude. there, right? Like even before some of the more maybe quote unquote enterprise providers, you'll get a DO pr- plugin before you're going to get one. Well, of those. yeah, and, and and you know part of that too is they have incredible pricing. So it starts at five dollars a month, but you can pay hourly too, which is nuts. And then on top, they've layered on these incredible services that are integrated right into the dashboard. They're part of the API. They're they're first class, like load balancers, block storage, high RAM systems. Like it's it's. Every move they have made has been really smart, and it's, I think, why they've just rocketed to the top, digitalocean.com. Use our promo code DOUnplug. That lets them know you heard about it here, which means they keep us going. But also, it gives you a $10 credit. Try out the $5 rig, or my favorite, the three cents an hour rig. With a $10 credit, it really makes it. There's there's several projects you could try with that. Digitalocean.com. Give it a go. Build your back-end infrastructure, your future website, your personal blog, or just toy around and learn more at digitalocean.com. DO Unplugged is the promo code you use after you sign up. Let's do a little elephant in the room discussion. There is a, there is a real serious reality. It's not something that we're totally shy of, but there's a real serious reality that for desktop Linux to be relevant and be successful long term, we're just going to have to have a whole crap ton of web apps. Universal apps, maybe some are WebAssembly, some are Electron, just a desktop full of them. Simple Note, Slack, Skype. Everyday business tools, web applications now. And it's just going to increase. There's, everybody has their pet favorites. It's just going to increase, right? Um, and I thought, I, I thought this was kind of an interesting blog post about uh, setting a just a – let's just embrace this and set a dot .web app file standard. So it's a file type dot .web app, and it's a free desktop specification. And if you use something like Natifier, which we're going to talk about a little bit more here in a second – this would be a way to just make a real simple. Here's the here's the dot file dot web app. This is where you create this. Is how you create the menu structure for it. This is the icon. All this stuff like it's a, like it's it's like a known standard. And in part part of me when I read this is like oh geez this is this is not the direction I want things to go. But then I thought about it. And it's like you have tools like Natifier. You have people that are distributing their entire applications in Electron like N1. Yeah, is one that I still use today. Totally. I mean, how many people use uh, Atom or Visual Studio totally. Code every yeah, day? Absolutely. And in some ways, this is critical for future expansion of the desktop. I think uh, for Linux because it's it's platform neutralizing. Uh, but we all are like intimately aware of what the problems are. Many of them are closed source, completely closed source. Many of them require some sort of backend infrastructure, which is also closed source, and in some cases has pervasive user tracking that violates your privacy. And all of them so far seem to have a performance overhead when compared to native applications that is less than ideal. Um, and so these are like obvious problems with that web applications. But then like at the same part, at the same time, the advocate of me says, yeah, but screw all that stuff. I want Linux to be the successful, prominent desktop right. platform one day. Um, and, you know, there are some advantages. As time goes on, I start to suspect that, once again, we're never going to agree on a, on a universal <laughs> packaging format. There's going to be app images and flat packs and snaps, and we're never going to have a universal packaging format. It's never going to really be something that all distros support. It's never going to happen. But you know what is universal? The web. So why not bypass all this bullshit, all this crap that the Linux community can't get their shit together around, and just deliver a web app? Plus, large industrial vendors like Adobe and AutoCAD and others, especially with things like Mozilla's initiative around WebGL Next, there could be like legitimate performance possibilities in an Electron app, in in a web app, and, and they could just bypass .exe, they can bypass DMGs, they can bypass flat packs. Yeah, sure. Here's the web app. Here's, you can download it for these different systems. Here's the web app. It almost, I mean, and then and plus the other benefit would be, of course, that it's available to a shit ton more developers and, and people can target many platforms. So it's much easier to carve out some revenue because you can get a couple of cheapo Mac users to pay. You can get a few ten, tens of thousands of Windows users and a few Linux enthusiasts to pay. 
And so you're not tied to one platform to make your money. So when Microsoft finally kills the desktop and makes it just a Linux-based OS and Apple makes iOS for the desktop, you, you're not completely screwed. So you've diversified your income sources. So it's obvious for developers, too, because you bypass distribution standards, you bypass app stores, you bypass packaging issues, you bypass dependent on a platform. It's a, it, I mean, like if I'm Adobe and I'm going to commit the next 15 years of development to something, it almost seems like a foregone conclusion. Which means as Linux users, we have to accept that our future is going to be tied to back-end services that require monthly payments, invade our privacy, and web applications that don't run as fast as they should, even though we now have these badass kit car style systems with an entirely open source platform. And we're running these closed source applications connected to closed source backends that run like shit. Is this a reality that we have to face? And is there some sort of middle in here that I'm not seeing? What do you think, Wes? And then, I'm gonna, and then after that, I'm gonna, I'd am gonna. i love to toss it around the chat room. I'd, I, Joe's in here. I'd love to talk, toss it to Joe to see what he thinks. Colonel Linux is in here. I'd like to get his thoughts, but I'll let you start. I think there's a lot of things there tied together, uh, especially, especially the proprietary aspect. Um, we're going to have proprietary software. We do already either way. I think there's a, there's a legitimate case that's frequently made on this network that we do want that, that we want that as part of our success. Whether, whether or not an individual Linux user wants that or not may be different, right? We all have opinions there. Um, I think there is a good case that you know that we are tied to these backend services, but again, when you get Google Drive integration in files on GNOME, that's the same thing, right? Like you're still tied to proprietary service. What the front end there doesn't really matter. Good point. Where I see it from the development side, I agree. Like there's some things that it makes sense for and some not. Uh, I'm running hyper.is, so it's like the ter- it's a terminal written in Electron. I don't know if that makes sense. Really? It's pretty snappy, a honestly. Bash terminal? Yes. I mean, a, a generic, you know, you can run whatever shell you want in it. Um, really? Yeah, you would, if you'd like. Yeah. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a shell. It feels very snappy. I've, I only just installed it. It looks good, too. It's in an app image. It does let you then, right, oh you my, have the full HTML oh God, if you want. My, my mind is spinning right now. <laughs> and that's on the edge for me. I don't know if that makes sense, right? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily do like a tiny little app, right? You don't need a full Chrome thing just to draw a little bit. But on the flip side, if you've spent your career developing interactive web apps, you're using D3, you're using other things, are you really going to go spend your time learning GTK? No. Maybe Qt. I think Qt has the strongest case, right, in terms of cross-platform availability. But what where, where Electron shines is because it's JavaScript and it's web, and that is reach. And if you're a developer with limited time, you're not excited about Linux or Windows or Mac. You're excited about the product you're making. Right. But, okay, so let me ask Joe this. So, Joe, what about the users, though? Because, like, one of the reasons I switched to Linux is because I was sick of bad performance on other systems. One of the reasons I switched to Linux is because I wanted transparency of code. One of the reasons I switched to Linux is because I wanted long-term visibility of where a project was going. And what's the point of having a GPL kernel and GPL user land tools and a GPL desktop environment if I'm running a closed source application? Is this a is this a compromise too far, Joe? Well, I think it's not a compromise too far for most people because um, most pragmatic people will use a bit of proprietary software um, on the desktop regardless. But I think that you're kind of looking at this from the wrong angle here. You see, you're talking about um, these kind of consumer applications like Skype, um, although I suppose Skype's a bit of a business uh, application. But you see, the thing is, the desktop is more or less dead, or at least dying, and everyone is moving to mobile, right? Except for the professionals using um, big software mm. like Pro People that want to get their work done. Yeah, and that kind of stuff, is it's very, very difficult to make that into web apps, isn't it? Well, I think today it is, but I don't know about long term. And no, so you think different. that maybe long term that is the way to get I don't know if big video editors and stuff over to Linux. Mm, God, I hope so in some ways, because otherwise it's never going to happen. I really think the only cho- I think the only the only realistic shot that Linux has is that Adobe releases Premiere for Linux at this point. Yeah. And the only way they're going to do that is if there's something that is substantially better to move to that is like the next 10 years plus for their platform, I would think. Otherwise, why not just keep releasing native builds for Windows and Mac? The other benefit maybe could be that it it, it does make it, right, if you can get better web acceleration use of those hardware components, other things that you need that differentiate a web app from a real app, Mm. then you've solved it for everyone Well, if you've got something like Obsidian and you start getting like a standard for audio and you start getting a standard for local database cache and stuff like that, you, you get to a point where you essentially have... The workings of anything you could have made out of a Java app, or anything you could have made right. out of, uh, you know, uh, something else. It's 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 in a runtime. I, I feel like it, you get actually pretty damn close. What you're talking about is the web browser becoming the operating system. Yeah, 
in a sense, yep. or or an Electron app or a, or a Natify or something like that, where it's it's a, using those technologies, but it pretends to be a desktop application. And I don't I don't like it really. And, and in fact, see, kernel Linux. I wanted to ask you because it seems like a huge component to all of these is then they always. It's not just that it's a web di- or an Electron app. It's also that it's it's cloud dependent, and and you have the whole lock in now to a cloud service, which has all kinds of uh, long term ramifications, which could be one of them being shut down. And so this could be another issue where all of a sudden one of the benefits of desktop Linux was with open source native applications, a developer might decide to quit one day. But if you if your business depended on it, hey, you fork the shit out of that thing, run an internal build and hire somebody to keep it going. And that was an actual possibility. But right now, if Nalaeus decides to pull the plug on N1, I'm totally screwed. My desktop application becomes completely non-functional. And you, that's got to bother you, Kernel Linux. And, you know, additionally to that, when you start looking at independent content creators, now we're taking our content, things that we spent our money, time, and effort, and we're putting that up into the cloud. And, you know, a lot of us would say, well, you know, in the, in the case of video editing, you know, and stuff like that, especially for Adobe, they wouldn't do anything, you know, terrible with it. But a lot of times what you see is as they change uh, to accommodate users that don't want to pay a lot of money. So, for example, in Facebook... When it started out, you uploaded a bunch of media. That was all your media. It was your pictures, your videos, that kind of thing. Then later on, they started changing the user agreement so that they could use some of some of that stuff. And so anytime you have content that you've created on somebody else's computer, I think that's that's a dangerous thing. Anytime you're running your business based on someone else's computer, I think that's a dangerous thing. Mm. So I don't have a real way to like spin this into like a happy-go-lucky, hurrah, desktop Linux thing. <laughs> I, I guess I would just like to, uh, to point out that you can have an entirely open source Electron app. Right? Yes. The whole framework is open source. Good if you point. want to improve it yes. to not use as much memory or whatever, and you're capable of doing that, you totally can. Yeah. yeah. Now, you can also use Electron with offline apps, so you don't need to be online either. Yeah. Now, Rod and I, er, producer Michael, I wanted to give you a chance also to sort of touch on, on your thoughts on using Natifier to take some of these applications and make it essentially feel like a local app. Yeah, because that's sort of, I mean, where we're going. Well, I mean, I, I, I've been using Natifier for a little while, and I've built, like, probably 10 of my own apps with it. Um, it, it can do a lot of, it's, it's really interesting because its purpose is to kind of, like, auto-build an Electron app for you. You give it, uh, tell it what, uh, you, you have a node and NPM installed, and you have uh, Electron in your system, mm-hmm. and then it just uses Electron to build everything for you based on the command, the parameters you use in the command. And then it just builds it, and it gives you like a full folder that's portable, oh. but it also integrates with your system. So it it uses your home folder to store the config files, so you can remake a new version with a new Electron when it comes out. Uh, you can have notifications b- built into your pl- whatever, pretty much whatever DE you want. Um, like there's there's a lot of uh, great tools for it, and the best part about it is that you can build your own um, your own apps without having to deal with uh, any kind of services. Mm. So like, uh, like I, got mine, I have like, like I have stuff that's on my server that is, you know, it is, it is a cloud service that is running on my server that is using Electron to do to, to use it. That's cool. All right. So that's kind of, that's sort of like a, uh, that's a middle ground. That's good. That's good. That's a middle ground I was looking for. We're less depressed than we thought we Thank might Thank you, be. producer Michael. You gave us the middle ground that we were hoping for. All right. Now, if you have a little middle ground and you want to share your thoughts, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. Of course, you can also go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com, although a bit of a shit show right now, so I probably... <laughs> Probably would Maybe just find us on Twitter yeah. or or yeah. join us live. Yeah, that'd be good. JBLive.tv for the live show. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at West Payne. The network's at Jupiter Signal. Also, go follow Colonel Linux at Colonel yeah. Linux on the network. Uh, he's uh, over there doing his thing and tweeting about all his shenanigans. And also, we appreciate the mumble room for joining us. You can also join that. Just check out the chat room at JBLive.tv. Do a bang mumble. Get the info. We do a little mic check. And you can join us. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday. This is negative. 
jbtitles.com. Everybody go over there. We'll pick our title, and then we will uh, get out of here for the Tech Snap crew. Thank you for being here, everybody. jbtitles.com. Uh, also, I just want to point out another web app. Uh, Etcher is awesome. Oh yeah, yeah Etcher is. I pretty forgot sweet. about Etcher. Damn, that's a that is actually the counter example right there. Etcher for Etcher for the win. And I actually been uh, studying up on app images with a uh, with electron based stuff, and uh, it's really cool. Like, I like app images a lot more than I used to because I, after researching it, it's uh, I kind of like app images more than flat packs now. The first time I used Etcher, that was the first time I used uh, App Image, and I was just I was blown away. Like it was it was one of those moments where the thing downloads, I double click on it, and I click on install, and I'm like, why why is not every application on Linux using this, and why haven't we been doing it for twenty years? <laughs> All right. Well, because right. I, I I did it on my Arch desktop, then I did it on my Fedora laptop, then I did it on my Ubuntu laptop, and the same freaking file runs on every single distro. Sure, 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 sure. We need to pick a title, JB Titles. Sure, we need to pick a JB. Sure, we need JB Titles. Sure, we need to pick a title, JB Titles. Com. Chris loves that's funny. Supports uh, sandboxing now too. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Pack attack, Solus my Solus. Getting in there. Don't forget the limitations of app it. images as well. Of course, but there's also limitations with black packs as well. Well, I can't games. Not the same limitations, limitations with an app images. image. You'll run into library issues. Oh. Yeah, so they might bundle some of the libraries, but you're still going to run into the sort of issues that you would have if you just downloaded the tarball and run it from that root. Whereas if you use something like Flatpak, you've got a fully contained rootfs. Essentially, you've got an entire true no, environment. No, no, because uh, they changed app images changed how they do their stuff within uh, like four or five months ago. They're now using SquashFS now, so there's no yeah, that, that, yeah. right. But that SquashFS that's just a bind mount that's gone into the true. It doesn't have a full true, so the system libraries can still contaminate. That's one of the problems. App image is very, very attractive because you can just double click it and go for it, as Noah said. But you can still get those issues, so they do need to be watched out right, for. But if you use a sandboxing, that's not going to happen. That's like what fire I just gel, said. for example. <laughs> no, fire gel on type of app image, you're not going to have those problems. Or you could just use one that works out of the box <laughs> without layers. Right, but when you have to install Flatpak into your mm. system, and then your system doesn't work in any way, and then the only, then it gives you these like ridiculously obscure errors, and the only and the actual solution is to reboot your machine, but the but the the system doesn't tell you that because that's that'd be too easy. <laughs> you had the quark errors as well, then. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, hey, you're missing this thing. Like, why am I missing it? Oh, because I didn't reboot. Oh, yeah, thanks. You could have just told me I need to reboot. Yeah, it's Snap kind of has the usability upper hand there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but I, there's there's a thing. I think the app image is only there's it's only flaw, well, not really only flaw because the sandboxing is a problem. But they have a solution for that. The only main thing that they don't have a solution for is the updating method. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. But they had a self right. updater that would be nice. So they they have a built in updating daemon, uh, but uh. the app image has to implement it <laughs> and. <laughs> It doesn't. Um, it only does it when you when you launch it. So like it says, oh, okay, here's an update. So it does work, but it, the app images developer has to use it. And you know, there's. Uh, it is really cool. And sounds also, like a Mac. Think, a lot of people. Well, it's, yeah. it is more <laughs> Mac than not. But it is. It, but a lot of um, people think that app images bundles everything, and they don't. It, app images only bundle what's necessary to bundle. If if the system. If a, an app image can assume that a package is available, like you know, a super massive, you know, global package, it's not going to be bundled. 